Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar um, focusing on decarbonising Orkney's lifeline services using hydrogen. Um, as a group of islands um, off the north coast of Scotland, um, planes and ferries represent a lifeline service for Orkney Islanders, but it also um, accounts for a large percentage of our overall use of fossil fuels. And that does represent a challenge on the road towards net zero. But with every challenge, there is opportunity. And that's what we're really here today to discuss. Um, my name is Cara Nog. I'm the Hydrogen Marketing Officer at the European Marine Energy Centre. EMEC initially got involved in hydrogen as a way to address local grid constraints um, and using surplus um, tidal and wind energy to produce green hydrogen. And that has led us to get involved in some exciting demonstration projects on the ground here in Orkney, and some of which we will hear a bit more about today. Um, so I've got a great lineup of speakers um, today, and I will just share my screen so that you can have a look at the agenda. Um, so we've got my colleague Richard Ainsworth from EMEC, followed by Julian Renz at Zero Avia. Then we'll have Beth Dawson, Do Beth Dawson um, from Fuel Cell Systems Limited, and followed by Ed McFarlane at Abbott Risk Consulting. Um, this is meant to be an interactive um, session today, and um, so we will have a Q&A session at the end, which will be chaired by my colleague James Ferguson, um, but very much encourage uh, participants to um, use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen, ask questions throughout, um, and we will then be able to have a, a good productive discussion. Um, I'm going to also just mention that um, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to view this at a later date, and we'll make that available to you. Um, and I'm just going to kick off by launching a poll just to get a better idea of um, the people that we have joining us today. Um, so let's see if I can do that. Okay, um, so this question, which sector best describes you? If you want to go ahead and vote, um, we can then get an idea of where you're all coming from. Great. Um, quite a mix. Um, a lot of people from the private sector today, but a good mix. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I will now hand over to my colleague Richie, um, Richard Ainsworth from EMEC to start, start off. Um, so, Richie, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Caroline. And hopefully you can all now see my screen. Uh, yeah, so my name's Rich Ainsworth, I'm the Hydrogen Manager here at the European Marine Energy Centre and uh, today I'm going to kind of talk you through, give you an introduction to some of the green hydrogen projects that we've got up in Orkney uh, involving transport and some of the challenges that we have on the road to net zero. So if you don't know where Orkney is, we're up in the, the northeast of Scotland, just between the mainland and Shetland, a group of islands, uh, there's around 70 islands, 20 of which are inhabited. We've got around 22,000 uh, people up here, a, a great mix uh, of, of people. Over the course of the, a year, we use around 732 gigawatt hours of energy. So, so not an insignificant amount. Um, sorry, can you, are you seeing the full slides or are you seeing the video at the bottom of? We can see the full slide. Okay, fine, sorry, error at my end. Um, yeah, so, the, so quite a, a significant use of energy on the islands, but we're, we're pretty good with our renewable electricity to date. Uh, we've actually been a net exporter since 2013. So what I mean by that is over the course of a, a year, we actually produce more renewable electricity locally 
than we consume. And this is down to the fact that we've got not only sort of large scale uh, wind generation, but we have uh, one in 10 households actually generating their own power. And that's either coming from micro wind or some solar. We don't get a massive amount of sunshine in Orkney, but we do have incredibly long summer days. We're at 18 hours of daylight at the moment. So it's a pretty good resource to be able to use. Um, we've got one of the highest uptakes in electric vehicles in the country. Uh, we've also got a great history of renewable energy. Um, EMAC, as Carol mentioned, is set up as a wave and tidal test facility. We've tested more marine energy devices up here than anywhere else in the world. And Orkney was also the site of the first grid connected wind turbine back in the 50s at Bunger Hill. So we're doing pretty good in terms of our renewable electricity. Uh, and, and we've got this uh, strong ambition to, to reach net zero. But we recognise that we're not going to be able to do that with renewable electrons alone. And we, we can't um, solve all our needs with just batteries and renewable electricity. So that's kind of where the green hydrogen aspect comes in and what we're hoping to try and achieve. So when you look at that the overall energy use, the, co the core energy used in Orkney, we can see it's, it's kind of broken down into three key areas, our industry, uh, our heat and electrical power. But the largest proportion is for transport, which is not surprising being a group of islands. And then when you break that down again, it's not surprising that the, the largest chunk of that is a marine transport. So over all of the energy used in, in Orkney, about 19% of that goes into to maritime use. Um, and that's not actually including our cruise industry. So we have a, a massive local cruise industry up in Orkney. 2019, we had 164 cruise visits, which was 150,000 passengers. Um, quite a considerable number. That's about three quarters of the total marine transport that happens uh, across the rest of Orkney. So, so not an insignificant amount. Some of those vessels can have around 5,000 people on them. And when they're disembarking into Kirkwall town of, of around uh, 8,000 people can make quite a big splash, but it's, um, it's a fantastic uh, income to the local economy. It brings in about eight million pounds a year. Um, and as well as that, we've also got a very strong maritime history in Scapa Flow. Um, Scapa Flow Bay is, is the largest natural harbor in Europe. And the, the council offers uh, a lot of harbor services through that. So there's the likes of ship to ship oil transfers and, and docking of, of off North Sea uh, vessels and stuff like that. Um, in addition to, to these, the, the Orkney Islands Council Harbour Service also oper own and operate the 29 piers and harbours. And from those, we have a whole range of lifeline transport services. We have eight vessels that service the islands and the local communities that are based there. And we also have five vessels that service Aberdeen, John O'Groats and Scrabster, which is on the north coast just next to Thurzo. And that's a mixture of passenger passenger vehicle and also cargo vessels. So it's all, it's very uh, critical to, to life up here. When you start to break down some of these services, you can kind of get an idea of the amount of fossil fuels that we're currently consuming and the, the cost that we have associated with that. So around 30% of marine fuel use is around the local industry and the local transport services that we have to the islands. And around 70% of it is in those mainland services back to the mainland Scotland. We've got about 210,000 passengers annually, and that equates to a fuel bill of around 6.4 million, which is quite a substantial amount considering that the majority of economic benefit from that fuel actually leaves Orkney. And not to mention the fact that it's, it's 36,000 tonnes of CO2. So we have a fantastic opportunity that we, as part of the net zero ambitions, we have to reduce that amount of CO2. And doing so, hopefully we can try and internalise some of that annual fuel bill and we can bring some of that um, in to benefit the, the local Orkney economy. In addition to this, we also have quite an aging ferry fleet as well, particularly for the, the island services. And we know that we have the net zero targets in Scotland of 2045. We're hoping to introduce that earlier in Orkney and being quite ambitious about that. But essentially that means these 30 year, 35 year lifespan assets could potentially not be allowed in the water um, the sort of next go around and you're, you're already shaving time off the, the end of that asset life if we don't commit to, to net zero options currently. One of the key projects that we've been involved in to explore the use of, of green hydrogen in the maritime sector is the Hydine project. So this is hydrogen diesel injection in the maritime environment. 
And essentially, this is integrating uh, an injection system um, that provides hydrogen gas to an auxiliary power unit on one of the ferries. It's the MV Shappensee, which services one of the, the shorter island ferry routes to the north of Kirkwall, our main hub in Norkney. Um, we have had several project delays. Uh, a lot of that's around regulation, um, but, but not least COVID as well. But we're hoping to get the vessel up in operation in October this year. And overall, it will give uh, an estimated 50% reduction in marine diesel use um, in the auxiliary engine. Because this is focused on the auxiliary engine, which essentially powers all the lights and, and electrical systems on the vessel, it's not going to give a massive reduction in the CO2 for the ferries. But that's not the, the purpose of this project. It's really to sort of uncover the regulatory barriers that we have trying to introduce hydrogen into the maritime space. And it is a key stepping stone for all the future projects that are going to follow. So key parts um, that have happened throughout the project is around the regulation and assessment. So at the moment, there's, uh, there's no sort of set in stone standards for using hydrogen in the maritime space, and we require new regulations to be developed. So we've been working closely with the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, the MCA, and also the project partners uh, at Lloyd's Register who have a great deal of experience in, in sort of risk assessment. Because this is a one-off project, we, we kind of go through a risk-based design, which is essentially looking at uh, all the safety concerns that you have from a specific installation. Um, there's a range of different workshops that we concluded and, and fed into uh, and, and produced reports from, including a hazard identification workshop and a hazard operability study. Lloyd's Register, and specifically Olaf Hansen, has a great deal of experience in hydrogen consequence modeling. So this is kind of looking at if an incident was to occur, occur what would be the, the follow-on effects for that. And because this is a one-off project, it's using this sort of approach that we can make recommendations. So the recommendation came back that the, the tank pack that you can see that's installed in the vessel on the left-hand side was actually um, include, uh, included in an enclosure to reduce the risk of severity of an incident happening. Apart from that, we also have to kind of um, work with what we have at the moment. Um, so we're adapting a lot of the automotive regulation for hydrogen use in terms of the, the fuel lines and the connections that we're using in our automotive. And we're also adapting the LNG guidance, which already exists for use of flammable gases in the maritime space. So a lot of the, the marine training is sort of based on the liquid natural gas stuff, which is not ideal because hydrogen behaves in a very different way but it is a certifiable course in hydrogen gas that mariners can use. So what we really need to see is a sort of fuel convergence. What do we want to use in the maritime space to reach those net zero targets? It's not necessarily going to be compressed gas hydrogen as it takes up a lot of volume, but we think that uh, green hydrogen can be a fantastic base for different types of synthetic fuel. And it's, it's once we get to that point, we can really start to build on these regulations and, and set some standards. Another key project um, up in Orkney to do with the maritime space is the High Seas 3 project. So this is going to be a fully net zero marine transport option. It's going to operate on the same Shappensee route um, just north of Kirkwall. String tests are ongoing to test the, the power drivetrain and this will be a fully propelled um, net zero vessel. It's going to hopefully increase the, the hydrogen demand in Orkney and hopefully unlock future infrastructure. And it's going to be a great demonstrator that we can have to showcase what's possible up here in Orkney, across Scotland, and further afield as well. Now, in the aviation space, we also have quite a lot of passengers annually. We have 180,000. We're consuming quite a bit of different types of fuel. On the right-hand side of the, the image above, you have the, the Logan Air SAMs, which fly to all the mainland um, airports in Scotland. And on the left-hand side, you've got the Britain, Norman Islanders, so they service all the, the smaller islands. Um, so both are equally as important and overall we see um, that around the fuel bill estimated for this is around a third of that of the marine sector but we're only about 15% of the actual emission so in terms of emission that's maybe not as low hanging uh, in terms of the marine space but it's still absolutely critical it's about connecting islanded communities and, and give them uh, access back to the mainland some of those have quite infrequent ferry services People often use the islanders for, for work commutes as well. And the links back to the mainland in Scotland uh, not only bring a lot of visitors to Orkney to support the tourism sector, but also um, facilitate a very important role in the NHS patient travel. So people that need to travel down to larger hospitals on the mainland are able to get treatment and care uh, when required. 
I'll just touch on the key project that we're working on in this because Beth and Julian will, will talk about this a lot more in their presentations, but the High Flyer project is looking at introducing green hydrogen into the aviation sector. Basically a phased approach from batteries to a fully fuel cell operated aircraft, sort of medium uh, range flights, and we're hoping to get an Orkney demonstration by the end of this year. Our role in the project is primarily to be supporting supply of green hydrogen and also infrastructure. Richard, sorry, just to... Sorry, final slide is basically we, we have a fantastic opportunity to, for green growth and basically we need to decarbonise, but we also want to harness the local renewable resources that we have to meet our transport needs and we have the opportunity to develop a lot of local skills. Post-COVID, we need to build back better and be a lot smarter about what we're doing to unlock these opportunities and the rest of our speakers will kind of go into the details required. Gone over by 30 seconds, but thanks, Karen. <laughs> thanks very much, Richie, for providing a good bit of context there um, for Orkney and its usage um, um, with those Lifeline services. I'm just going to quickly um, launch a second poll, um, which is, do you think that there is enough support in your area to achieve net zero targets? Um, Richie, whilst that Whilst people are voting, I just a uh, question came out in the, the Q and A um, just on those figures in the marine tables mm -hmm. that you mentioned. So a uh, question from Esnur, uh, wondering whether these numbers are um, annual or if they are from a specific year. Yes, sorry, I should have said that those are annual numbers, uh, and they've been in two thousand and eighteen. Brilliant. Thank you very much for clarifying. Um, so we'll end the poll there. Some people thinking. Um, quite a resounding 65% of people thinking no, that there isn't enough support at the moment. So that's um, an interesting um, point that we can maybe come back to in the Q&A at the end. Um, I will now hand over to Julian Renz. Um, project, High Flyer project manager at uh, Zero Avia. And you've had quite a busy week, Julian, which I'm sure you will um, elaborate on further. Um, if you want to take the floor now. The... I'll do that, yeah. Thanks, Karen. And I actually also realized that this is, of course, uh, an interesting time to talk about sustainable aviation. Probably would have been a great time to actually do a quick poll here in the beginning, because I can imagine that uh, of the, I don't know, 150 people or so on the Zoom call, probably not many people have actually been flying over the last five months. So it's clearly a pretty unique situation for aviation overall. Um, but one that has definitely intensified the need for a solution that is actually green. And this is what I want to talk about first is just that when we talk about decarbonizing lifeline services for island communities, but also when we talk about decarbonizing um, kind of the entire system, aviation is really one of these sectors where we just don't have solutions today, essentially. I mean, yesterday, um, maybe some of you have actually read the report that came out by the Committee of Climate Change here in the UK. And essentially, they singled out two sectors where they see um, emissions increase as a reasonable trajectory forward, and that is agriculture and aviation. We at Zeravia think that uh, that is not a actually long-term sustainable solution for the sector. Like we cannot increase emissions, and we think that our vision to actually make clean aviation possible is one that has been getting a lot of momentum over the last months, really. When we started out roughly two years ago, everything in aviation was still, you know, almost denying the climate impacts of it and was saying, well, we're only 2% of the problem and we will find solutions as we will. Corsia is great. Carbon offsets are great. And these kind of conversations happened roughly a year ago, you know, battery electric aircraft were the solution to everything. But now, especially since Clean Sky, the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking and McKinsey published a report this Monday. I think there is a growing awareness across the entire industry that actually renewable, renewably powered hydrogen electric aviation is a solution that is not only zero emission, 
but also ultimately lower cost, especially on some of the smaller airframes that we're targeting. And so let me talk quickly about what we actually do in Zeravi here as part of the supply chain. And Richie has already pointed out the kind of left-hand side of the picture a little bit, right? Talking about how you actually produce green hydrogen. And so that is something where we partner with people like Richie and, and EMIC overall to supply us that. And we also partner with the actually airframe manufacturers. So people like Cessna or Viking or you know, Airbus, if you want to scale it up. But what we really focus on is the powertrain part of it. So essentially everything from the hydrogen reaching the aircraft and through the hydrogen storage tank, integrating that with the fuel cell system, um, which converts it together with the oxygen from air into electricity. And then the electric, uh, electricity drives the electric motors and the propellers to actually generate thrust so that the aircraft can take off and cruise and uh, get us all where we need to be. Um, now, in the title of my talk, right, I promised you kind of three reasons why I think uh, hydrogen is going to be the solution for lifeline services for island communities and for larger aircraft overall. So let me just quickly walk through the three ones that I'm mentioning at the bottom in a bit, little bit more detail. Because the first reason, right, is simply that out of the zero emission options, which are essentially, well, really is only battery electric if you compare that and um, you simply get more performance out of a hydrogen based system even if we use gaseous hydrogen so you have compressed gas storage tanks on board of the aircraft and um, you get roughly four times the range with a hydrogen based system versus a, a battery electric based system and that is relevant to the operators because they want to replicate their routes they're flying today as closely as possible and if they get sufficient range from the aircraft then they can actually also use that aircraft in different missions and cannot only use them you know for very specific routes where the range requirements are very very low the second reason is that if you actually look at the life cycle emissions of a hydrogen electric powertrain versus a battery electric powertrain, and even versus, a, I mean, of course, right, versus a jet fuel powertrain. And you get 50% low emissions compared to um, the battery electric version, if you compare, you know, green electricity with green hydrogen. Um, and you also get 90, 95% low emissions compared to the jet fuel powered turboprop engine. And the reason for that as well with jet fuel versus hydrogen, I think, you know, everybody knows why green hydrogen is called green hydrogen. Second, for the battery electric aircraft versus a hydrogen electric aircraft, it's really the emissions that come in the production process of the battery versus the fuel cell system and the hydrogen tanks, where the battery is just much more energy intensive to manufacture. And actually by cycling through those batteries much quicker, that's how you um, get to these numbers. And then the final point here on the very right hand side is probably the most relevant actually for, you know, each one of you ultimately choosing a hydrogen powered aircraft versus a battery electric aircraft, because you don't want to spend, you know, too much extra money on flying green. Um, and actually with a hydrogen electric system, you get 30% lower costs to operate the powertrain versus battery again, and up to 60% lower costs versus the turboprop engine. And the reason for that is um, simply that, well, the cost of fuel is, it can be cheaper for hydrogen versus jet fuel. Um, and again, the maintenance costs and the cycling costs are much lower for the hydrogen system versus the battery electric system. And then for us as a company, right, the final reason for why we believe in hydrogen electric very much is that we can start with something credible today, and I'll get to that in a second, but there's also a credible route for its scaling to larger and larger aircraft within the next 10 to 15 years. So the French government and Airbus, for example, have just announced that you know, by 2035, they can very well imagine a hybrid, a hydrogen powered Airbus 320. And if you look at the report that came out on Monday, it essentially shows that hydrogen will probably be the lowest cost solution to reduce emissions from larger and larger aircraft going forward. So that's really why we think this is super exciting. And um, we are also, you know, not only talking about it, we're actually uh, doing work 
We have done so for the last yeah, two and a half years. We flew our first prototype in California um, early last year, and we have set up operations um, late last year here in the UK as well. And um, through the program that Richie already mentioned, which is called the High Flyer Project. So where we work together with EMEC and Intelligent Energy, where we received a five and a half million pound grant from the UK government to essentially do the first step on our journey, right? The first step is really demonstrate that the technology is ready to power a commercially relevant aircraft. And really the first size that we see there is the six seat Piper that you see in all these three pictures here. And because that is actually used today in air taxi operations. And that powertrain is also used in the aircraft that are used today in um, Logan Air's operations up on the Orkney Isles, for example, in the Norman Islander. And what we're doing at the moment is we are um, doing work here in the hangar. So kind of you know 50 meters away from me at the moment. We're repowering that aircraft. We're taking out the stock engine. We are putting in the electric drivetrain. We're first running it from a battery and then going through the step of a hybrid system. So a hydrogen and battery hybrid. And then the final step and the one that will actually get us to the demonstration flight from Orkney will be a fully hydrogen powered system without any hybridization batteries in it. And um, now, as you can see here in this slide, it says extensive UK flight testing and demonstrations later this year. Actually, as of this week, right, we can say this is not only later this year, this is actually starting now. And I'll take away the sound. You can uh, find the video afterwards online if you just uh, look, at, look, up, you, look up Zero Avia on YouTube. Um, but this is our first flights in the UK. As you can see, uh, we have three vehicles accompanying us. So that's uh, <laughs> they probably emit more than the aircraft at this point. And um, for us, this was a huge milestone because you know after COVID and after, of course, the university shutting down, the hangar shutting down, we have now, with COVID delays, actually finally we're allowed to start our flight testing here. It's the largest zero emission aircraft in Europe at the moment. And we're hoping to make it not only the largest, but also the longest range zero emission aircraft shortly as we're progressing through flight testing um, this summer. And then finally, we hope to touch down after a 200 to 300 nautical mile flight from Orkney to somewhere um, on the Scottish mainland by November this year. And that will culminate, or that will be the final result of our high flyer project. And now with these final pictures here, um, I will just say thank you for attention. And um, as soon as I'm stopping sharing my screen, I'll look at the questions that have come up and we can discuss some of them probably during the Q&A and the other ones I'll answer in text. Thank you. Back to you, Karen. Great, thank you very much, Julian, for that. Um, I think that was really, it's really interesting and exciting to see just um, the test flight that happened this very week. So and I know I speak for all of us and we're very excited to see the technology move into the next phase um, of integration and uh, looking forward to welcoming it to Orkney. Um, so I'd like to invite my next speaker to the floor, um, Beth Dawson. Um, who is the Projects Manager at Fuel Cell Systems Limited. Beth, the floor is yours. Hello, righty. Hopefully I should be sharing my screen. Let me just get rid of that. Sorry. And do that. Okay. So yeah, Beth Dawson from Fuel Cell Systems Limited. Um, a little bit about us. Um, so it's not just a clever name. Um, we are, our day job, if you like, is uh, installing and integrating fuel cell systems, unsurprisingly. Um, so the, we work across a number of uh, power ranges and we work across um, a lot of different fuel types as well. We use methanol, we use um, natural gas, we use propane. Um, but hydrogen keeps coming up time and time again as being the, the fuel of choice, especially um, for all the transportation um, 
activities. Um, the issue with any hydrogen fuel cell insulation is almost never the fuel cell. The fuel cells are brilliant and work straight out the gate, do exactly what they're meant to do. Um, the issue tends to be where on earth are you going to get the fuel from? Um, and we saw this coming as a problem. We experienced it as a problem, integrating um, hydrogen fuel cells in static environments. Um, but and then we realised that the manufacturers were having the same issue as well. So the car manufacturers particularly, we, we came across also um, the, the scooter uh, manufacturers, you can see at the bottom there, they had issues too. And we thought, well, hang on a minute, we're quite good at integrating high pressure hydrogen systems. Maybe we can help. So that's why we started to get into the hydrogen refuelling um, environment as well. And you can see a few of the products that we've, we've put in place there, including our refueling truck. And also there's the mini hydrogen dispenser that's been integrated by the AA there and um, a, our high cube, which is currently uh, filling the Hydroflex train. So people, I think, tend to think of hydrogen transport being a future thing. Indeed, the name Mirai, which is the Toyota vehicle, uh, is, means future in Japanese. But actually, they are here today. Um, so forklift trucks can pay back on a commercial basis, um, given the right operating environment. Um, they are, they, these are the cars that are available today, so that's the Mirai, the Nexo and the Honda Clarity. Honda Clarity is very popular across California and um, obviously in Japan as well. Um, and we're seeing you know, some uptake within Europe as well. Um, and I'd say the UK is, is somewhat behind some of our European neighbours so um germany's doing particularly well and uh, norway italy so yeah and, and france indeed as well they're, they're using um fuel cell range extended vans for all the parisian post office vehicles which is quite exciting um so um they are here today uh, and that's some a london bus route that's actually finished now but they double deck buses um can really only be done with hydrogen if you try and do it with battery you're um you lose too much uh, volume and uh, add too much weight and so you it's yeah it doesn't really work whereas hydrogen is here today they, the uh, double deckers are going into Liverpool first but then they should be um, coming across a number of different cities in the UK as well so here today so to go onto the fuel the hydrogen needs to be available at the right time the right place the right volume the right pressure and the right purity a lot of things to ask for in a fuel and also we need to think about the safety first so as Ed um, will be talking about in, a, in just a few minutes um, the, there is a limited uh, suite of um, reg, rules and regs that are available at the moment and what we're doing um, is lifting and dropping the, the regulation sets from other industries into this new environment um, but the the basis of hydrogen um, it's been used within industry for over 70 years now and 55 million tons of it are used within industry all around the globe all the time so like i say there's it's well understood as a as a molecule as a gas as a fuel it's about understanding those properties and uh, implementing the right things at the right time um, we're pleased to be as fuel cell systems we're pleased to be on the panels um, for the british compressed gas association and the um, apea which is um looks after like petrol stations and things in the UK. We're on all the panels for that to try and get the, the regulation to be more helpful and um, uh, consistent across the industry. So in terms of purity, um, as we've mentioned by Richie earlier, it's um, the excess renewables on Orkney are being used to um, generate hydrogen by splitting water. Um, and stored and then used from there. Um, this isn't the way that most hydrogen in the world, that 55 million tonnes per year I mentioned, most of that, 95% of it, is um, via steam methane reforming. Um, and because that's, you're starting with you know, a heavier fuel that requires quite a lot of cleanup after um, the production of hydrogen, whereas the um, hydrogen produced via electrolysis is generally very clean already and it just needs some, some light drying to take it to uh, uh, being perfect for fuel cells. Fuel cells uh, require quite um, high purity uh, fuel, sort of the five nines as it's, as it's known, um, otherwise the, any deleterious elements can um, interfere with the, the catalysts in, inside. Um, if you're using hydrogen for combustion, of course, it can be a little, but the, the P2 
purity requirement isn't quite the same. It's, it's a little more lax than that. Uh, in terms of volume, now I, I know I'm using volume wrong. If there's scientists on this, um, on this webinar, I, I apologise now for my incorrect usage. Um, but what I mean here is how much hydrogen we need. So what we it feels intuitive to me that um, like a car needs a certain amount of hydrogen, a bus would need more than that, and a train would need more again. And that's when we start looking at the onboard tanks and how much they hold, and then the method for getting the hydrogen into those tanks. Are we trailering it in? Are we producing it on site? Are we looking at mother daughter stations where you're producing on site and then transporting elsewhere? All of these things are valid. It's about understanding the, the remit to try and hit a, a, a sweet spot um, because there's, um, uh, there's a trade off to be had between capex and opex, there's a trade off between uh, weight and volume, there's a trade off between um, the expense of various installations as well. So it's, it's about understanding what it is you're trying to achieve and then putting in place the ideal equipment to achieve that, that need. And then we come on to pressure, obviously pressure and volume highly related when we're talking about gaseous fuels. Um, so hydrogen does need to be compressed um, in order to be used as a fuel. And of course, compression takes energy. Um, so the two standards that have been used to date are 350 bar and 700 bar tanks. Um, you can see the difference in the, in the tanks on the image there. Um, the 700 bar requires an awful lot more material just to hold that hydrogen in place. Uh, 700 bar is 10,000 psi if anyone needs a, a different uh, metric. Um, so as you can see, yeah, there's a lot more um, material there, but al also um, all the other components that sit around that um, within the vehicle are also at a higher spec because they have to be at that point. And um, the they're therefore more expensive so again it's about but you'll get double the range so a car that had a 350 bar tank versus a car that had a 700 bar tank i mean at the moment all the cars are 700 bar and um the ranges are between sort of three four hundred miles on a full tank if they only had 350 bar tanks they would have half the range it's that simple um so it's, it's that trade understanding that trade-off um it's more expensive to have the the higher pressure but you get the range, what's the, what's the sweet spot, where is it worth it? And then to think about how we dispense, again, this is, I'm trying to get this down to sort of a lay person's thing, because it's, I think it's um, obviously people who are used to dealing with gases are, are quite used to this, but people who are more used to dealing with liquid fuels, it's, it feels a bit strange. So um, what we tend to think of is say to people, if you had, two balloons, one of which was full and one of which was empty, and you joined them together at the neck and then stood back. Given time, they would equilibrate between the two and they'd end up with the same pressure. So it's that, that process that we're trying to use during the dispensing operation. And what we end up with is a very large balloon of high pressure gas, that's the storage, and we're trying to fill a smaller balloon um, to the same sort of pressure. So we're using a cascade flow, and that's the, the most energy efficient way of dispensing. Um, this, this process that is used at all of the static stations across the UK currently, I say all of them, it's about 12. There's more coming, but uh, we need an awful lot more of them. Um, and in the interim, what we're looking at doing is putting together some sort of smaller solutions. And our goal here is that we are only supplying the equipment required to fulfill the hydrogen need. And that's to keep that initial capex down. Um, and, and offer like a starter place to go from. Um, so the products that we have at the moment is the, the mini hydrogen dispenser, it's like a hydrogen jerry can. Um, then we haven't made a high van yet, but it's on my hit list, I wanna do it. Um, we've made our own uh, dispensing truck. It's not a hydrogen producing truck, it's just a dispensing truck. Um, we can do um, containerized solutions as well, right up to full static stations. But yeah, it's, um, it's about finding that sweet spot in terms of the refueling. This is the truck. Um, the scooter that you see there is a Metropolitan Police one. It's um, from the Suzuki manufacturer with an intelligent energy stack inside it. Um, that uh, they had a trial of eight 
uh, scooters in London and um, they needed to have fuel. It's a small tank on board, but 700 bar and the static stations that are available couldn't fill it. It fell outside of the standard protocols. Um, so we deployed the truck and had 500 filling events over 18 months and all went according to plan. It was beautiful. So yeah, very pleased. And since then the truck has fueled the Hydroflex train uh, and we fueled Mirai and Nexo at various events. We're really pleased with it. And it's this solution that we feel is most appropriate for the High Flyer project, which is a really exciting project. Um, so we're looking at, I think, two times eight kilogram tanks, um, which we think we can fill within around half an hour using a, a nice slow fill without chilling. Um, hydrogen heats as you pass it through an aperture. So it's, in, you know, with, if you're not going to externally chill, you need to slow it down so that you keep your, your temperature um, happy. Um, so that's our truck currently on site with the plane at the moment, ready for when the, uh, that is, has got the hydrogen systems on board. And then we've built the, the new truck for the High Flyer project. Um, this will be delivered over to Cranfield in the coming weeks. Watch this space. Um, and inside the, the back of that truck, you can see there's a, a, a bank of tanks, if you like. Um, and those will be pressured to 500 bar. Um, so our hydrogen input can be MCPs or tube trailers or indeed an electrolyzer. Um, so we need a hydrogen input and then the idea is that we're compressing up on board the truck, storing at 500 bar so we can dispense at 350 because we've just um, decided that 350 is the, is the sweet spot for the, the plane. Yeah, so, sorry yeah. to interject there. Let's need, oh, that was it. <laughs> 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 so I think we're there. So if I stop sharing now. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much, Beth. Um, great presentation. Um, we'll move, just conscious of time, so we'll move straight on to Ed McFarlane, um, System Safety Engineer and Principal Consultant at Abbott Risk Consulting. Take the floor, Ed. Um, yep, yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll share my screen. And let's get the PowerPoint presentation up. Okay. Um, so this presentation, uh, first off, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for, for attending. Very much appreciated. Um, I've seen there's several questions on, on the Q&A kind of around the safety area, but I think probably better to deal with them in the QA in a bit more detail. This presentation is really more about a kind of broader challenge of, uh, of safety assurance in a kind of complex, dynamic, and changing a new area. Um, so touching on a number of the, the items that Beth, Richie, and, and Julian have all mentioned. Um, so quite a grand title, developing a safety case for hydrogen and a whole systems approach. Um, but as a traditional, I'll actually start at the end and work, work backwards. So this phrase, whole systems, is, is used an awful lot around hydrogen, but also in a broader energy transition discussion. And everyone says they're going to be taking a systems approach. What does that actually mean, or a whole systems approach? So when we talk about systems, it's, it's the discrete elements, system elements, and the interfaces between them. And that is a dynamic thing. It's not fixed in time. So for around the, the, the topic we're discussing, uh, sort of transport more broadly, what, what does our whole systems actually mean? Is it just the vehicle and all the elements within that? Because that's the system. Is it the vehicle and the refueling systems? Do we need to consider the bunkering, the refueling means of doing it? Uh, or is it the vehicle, the refueling systems, and the regulatory regime, which has been touched on by Beth as well? Or, or is it the whole planet Earth? and it's immediate orbital environment. Um, and given that there's discussions of geoengineering things where people are putting mirrors in orbit, um, it's not actually a ridiculous thing to say. Um, here's one definition of what people actually mean by the whole system. So from Chaudhry et al, 2009, so it defines the UK energy system as the set of technologies, physical infrastructure, institutions, policies, and practice located in and associated with the UK, which enables energy services to be delivered to UK consumers quite a lot going on there. And that little phrase there, associated with the UK, covers a huge amount of things. That's covering all the electrical incomers, all the gas pipelines, all the LNG tankers coming into the UK, plus all the meteorological and geographic area around us in which, over which our reach of, so the wind and wave generation is happening, all coming into the UK. It's a really broad area. So in summary, it's complicated, or even better, complex. But why do we care? Why do we even want to bother looking at it? It seems like a really intractable problem or certainly makes life a lot more difficult. 
So why do we care about this whole systems approach? Well, quite often the things we actually care about are not achieved through a single discrete element of the system. They emerge from the totality of the different elements and their interactions. If you think of this as the difference between saying, I want a car, well, it's not what you want. What you want is, well, maybe it's not, maybe you just want a car. I want to be able to travel between two, two locations at a time I decide. And that, from that, that flows a whole other thing. There's the car, there's the refueling, there's the road infrastructure, there's all the road rules that allow you to drive safely and actually get to your other destination. So it's actually a more complex arrangement to achieve what you really want, the actual intent. And often, and this is where we're getting into safety, is often the problems we need to deal with arise or emerge, and again, that's an important concept, from the same complex interactions. Classic example of this is traffic jams. Traffic jams quite often occur on road systems with no apparent cause, not road works, not anything else, it's just that the volume of traffic and the specific con configurations and behaviors result in sudden slowing of traffic. And it's a classic example used both in sort of chaos theory and all these other, various other ideas used around complexity. And so from sort of a safety angle, these complex problems that arise include the potential accident and loss scenarios which we attempt to manage through safety engineering and management. So in summary, we could talk, when we talk about whole systems, what we're really talking about is identifying and dealing with the complexity and all the things that are related to that. So what do we mean by complexity? So it, it's the mess, which is the kind of what thing most people think of. So complexity isn't just that, it, oh, it's very difficult. It's the mess. So it's the number and diversity of system elements and their interactions and external um, interfaces as well outside of your immediate system. The internal structure, you have systems embedded within systems within embedded within systems. And within that, you even have elements that are complex in their own right. So think of automated behavior, automation, smart grids, smart systems that people are discussing. The other thing that complexity has is this principle of emergence. So the sum of the whole is greater than the parts. You have behaviors and characteristics that only come together and become available once you reach a certain level of complexity. And the other aspect that complex systems have is this idea of nonlinear behavior. So they're not completely random. They're not completely deterministic. They're somewhere in the middle. And the classic example that people point to is this thing called the butterfly effect. The idea that a butterfly is wing flat in Mexico can result in a tornado in Texas. You also have the corollary of that, which is that very large interventions can have very minor effects. And a kind of a classic example of this is, is impl implementation of government policy. Millions spent for very little benefit. And this is one of the characteristics of, co of complex systems, especially when they're persistent and exist over long periods of time. They're very resistant to change. And this is one of our challenges within the energy, energy transition is that we're trying to change a complex system. So, that's fine, that's kind of background. To go. So what does that actually look like in comparison with our kind of specific example? So we have this wonderful hydrogen aircraft. We've got a lovely hydrogen refueler from fuel cell systems. And we've got this wonderful, pure and cheap and readily available hydrogen supply from EMEC. So that's our system, is it? Well, there's probably a few more elements we need to think about. That hydrogen supply needs an electrical supply and it needs a water supply um, to actually generate the hydrogen. So is that our system now? Well, I can think of a few other things you might want to add. A pilot helps if you have an aircraft. You probably want to also have your passengers to actually do something unless you're just going to transport cargo. Well, we've identified some, some people now or, or kind of actors to, to associate with the hydrogen aircraft. There's probably a few other people associated with the other elements of the system. So we have all the operators of the refueler, the hydrogen supply, the people involved with operating and managing the water supply, the people who operate and manage the electrical supply. Oh, and there's someone else as well who's not actually physically beside these items. We've got a controller who's monitoring that hydrogen supply and the electrical supply and the water supply remotely. So they're in a control room somewhere and they've got all the interactions and systems they use to monitor and, and manage all of those. Okay, fine. So that's, that's probably our system now, isn't it? Well, there's probably a few other bits and pieces. You're doing this all at an airport and the airport's going to talk to the pilots, the refuelers manage all the ground operations, the aircraft, the hydrogen supply, and we've here got electrical incoming coming through the airport infrastructure. Okay, so that's probably it now, isn't it? Well, you don't just live at one airport. You tend to want to fly to another airport, so you're probably going to need to talk to air traffic management. 
So they're going to need to understand the characteristics and behavior and capabilities of that hydrogen aircraft. Also to deal with issues, to say if they need to divert to another airport in an emergency situation, can I divert to another airport that knows how to handle and deal with hydrogen and fire? Right, okay, so that's ATM. So, so that's probably it now. Is it, well, the CAA is probably going to be interested in this. So they're going to need to talk to the pilot, need to talk to ATM, the airports, and also understand how hydrogen refuelers and everything work in that. But unfortunately, our pilot was actually certified in America. So we want to have a conversation with the FAA as well. So we've got the interaction of the FAA, CAA, right? We've got some regulators there for all the airport stuff. Well, they're probably not the only regulators we need to think about. Other elements of the system have got a regulatory environment as well. So HSE, that, that will cover off all our stuff that's on the ground. That'll be great. Well, actually, unless you're above a certain size or a certain level of risk, the HSC takes a very light touch and actually pushes an awful lot of responsibility for regulating and oversight of these systems to other people. So the local council will often have a big input and influence on it. So you want to be talking to that, and the local council will be wanting to talk to probably the airports, they have an involvement, and all the other people. Is that it now? Well, weather has quite a big influence, especially when you've got an electrical supply that's based on renewables, but the ATM are going to want to talk to the Met Office as well. The airport probably is as well. Uh, and it's, that influences the whole lot. And the CAA will want to set characteristics and stuff. And the thing you've got to remember about the Met Office, certainly in the UK, is that actually it's really the MOD. They're a subsidiary of it. So is that it? Well, we've also then got the regulator for the electrical supply, Scottish Water. Um, oh, hang on a sec. That hydrogen refueler has got to get to the site somehow. Well, we're probably going to want to talk to Transport Scotland and also the, the Secretary of State for Transport. They're going to be moving it on the roads. What I'm trying to display with this is that very quickly your system gets very complicated. This is just mess, but all those interactions between all these elements as well. Now that can seem like a bit of a task at times. And I think what we need to move to is probably what has been described and what has been spoken about by Richie earlier is that we can't totally say that things are safe we have to have a risk management approach so we need to accept that risk exists and we need to focus on the net risk so the risks of not acting what are we trying to mitigate the risks of acting and we need to understand the benefits of actually undertaking that act Defi we need to define the whole system in a practical way for the specific task at hand and accept the limits of our control and we also need to be accepting of uncertain uncertainties and unknowns but be explicit about it and work towards reducing them as we learn and we need to be focusing on the focusing of identifying and managing risk to make the potential outcomes more positive. For every risk we mitigate to a certain level, we need to do it, and this is becoming an ongoing and iterative um, process. But I'm just going to jump in quickly, just conscious of time, and to get onto the Q and A. Um, if yeah. you're able to last slide, I, yeah, you're cool. So just to end on a brief note of optimism. Um, we have as a society managed, and that's not the same as eliminated, challenging in international environmental issues. So acid rain and the impact on the ozone layer from CFCs. We've also managed, which again is not eliminated, existential risks. So the potential for, for nuclear annihilation has existed since the end of the Second World War. And to date, it's not happened. We have managed it, and that's not just purely by chance. That's also through active controls put in place and managed through, through the nuclear nations. The complex behavior of the whole system, while it can seem worrying, is actually a positive thing. If we get things right, we have a really coherent approach, we can have a dramatic change quite quickly. There are engineering disciplines, systems engineering, and also analytical disciplines, complexity theory and system thinking that can support this. Let's use that skill base. And good safety management should give us greater confidence to actually try things by making sure that we highlight and mitigate and manage those issues and concentrate on the positive aspects. And I'll uh, finish there and hand over for the QA. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ed. And thank you to all our speakers for providing really detailed, interesting conversations, which we've had a lot of interaction throughout the session on. So I'll just hand over to my colleague, James, who's going to chair the Q&A session. Um, James, over to you. Hi, thanks, uh, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so we've, we've only got a few minutes now. Um, so I've highlighted some main questions. The, the first one I'd like to ask is about ammonia. Um, so that was highlighted for use in cruise ships and on planes. Would anyone like to, to make some comments about the use of ammonia, Richie, and our lifeline services and Julian 
um, perhaps on the use in plans. It's, it's certainly something that, that's being explored along with lots of different types of synthetic fuels, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, liquid hydrogen itself. Um, there, there's a proposal for a, a green ammonia plant up in Orkney uh, that's, that's going into planning at the moment. And we have seen that some pretty large players in the maritime industry, such as MAN, who are a, one of the biggest engine manufacturers, are closely looking at ammonia as well. So there's definitely room for it to happen. And, and we would hope that that, that could be based on green hydrogen and, and definitely trying to get these net zero fuels and it, and it is an option. So, and, it, and it's, it's one of the ones that can hopefully mitigate some of the, the risks that Ed's talking about as well. So. And yeah, so for, for the aviation use case as well, we are not looking at um, using it on board. The main reason for that is that we think it's one of the key pieces when you start thinking about certification of the powertrain. I know there was also questions around that timeline and so on, is that the less complex or so the simpler your system is, the easier it's generally to certify. So if you now start including ammonia as a fuel and part of the aircraft, you need something that bridges the gap between like ammonia and your hydrogen fuel cell system. As something is an additional system which you need to you know, prove to the regulator or to the certification agency that that is safe and you know all the failure modes and so on and so forth. So we're not looking at it for that. We do see a quite interesting case for ammonia as an energy carrier or as a, as a kind of hydrogen transport medium, if you will. So in locations, right, where on-site green hydrogen production is not economic or you know it's difficult to get the permitting in place and things like that, we could very well imagine, right, that you would have like hubs of green ammonia production at sites where there is plenty of renewable energy at very for very cheap costs. And then you use green ammonia to transport it and reconvert it wherever we are at the airport. Great, thank you. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question, I think. Uh, can can I get your thoughts on the the potential market for these um, hydrogen planes? So, how many planes do you think uh, there will be a demand for, potential for rollout, and also the interest in um, people who currently lease their planes? That's how they provide a service. Uh, what do you think their uptake um, is likely to be of this new technology? Yeah, I saw the questions, and and I do realize right, like that the the Q and A is now probably too short to answer all of them. Um, so, like if 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 you do want to elaborate on them further, feel free to shoot me an email. I think um, the, my email was on my last slide and you'll probably receive that from Karen afterwards. Um, in terms of the market that we, that we see for our technology, right? I mean, the, the starting point that what we're developing kind of now is the a 600 kilowatt powertrain. And you can think about that powertrain fitting essentially aircraft that can either carry anything between nine and 19 passengers. The 19 is a bit of an artificial number. We don't need to get into detail why, but the difference between nine and 19 is you use either one engine or you know, two engines, essentially. And of those aircraft, there's more than 10,000 um, flying today. And actually most of those are in commercial use cases. And so we very much see that as our target market initially. And we also have received quite a lot of interest actually from airlines specifically in Europe, that fly larger aircraft today. Um, Richie showed the Saab um, up on Orkney, actually, next to the Norman Islander. So it's actually, it, it was a beautiful picture, and I would actually lo love to nick it for my next presentation. Because one of the reasons why people go to larger Norway aircraft is because they're generally cheaper per seat to fly. Now, if you manage to get 19-seat aircraft, for example, to run on hydrogen, and those actually are cheaper to operate, then that might actually be your cheapest route to A, a zero emission aircraft, and B, just generally be cheaper than operating that Saab. And so we see a lot of interest um, from those regional airlines to step down one size of aircraft to those 19 seat aircraft and operate that. So that's really kind of the, the two target markets, if you will, that we're seeing. Yeah. Super, super. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, I'm sorry for everyone who's, who's, most of you, whose questions we didn't get to. Um, uh, perhaps we'll have a chance to disseminate those later. Uh, so thank you for all of those questions and I'd like to hand back over to Karen now. 
Thank you, James, and thank you to our panelists there. As Julian said, um, we can um, we'll share the slides um, from our speakers after this presentation, where you can access their contact details. So if there was a, a question that was unanswered, then please do get in touch either with um, the speakers or you can email emec at info at emec.org.uk and we will um, endeavour to get it, respond to your questions. Um, thank you very much again, everyone. I think it was really, uh, really useful, really interesting discussions and um, as I said, this will be made available on YouTube so that you can watch this again at a later date. Thank you to everyone who has participated and have a great Friday.